it is important to consider that the promotion of women leadership and decision making roles and women empowerment it's not only a matter of social inclusion and diversity it is most importantly a matter of economic convenience to bring prosperity to the world According to McKinsey and Company, if we had more women in the labor force, the global potential GDP would raise 26% by 2030. Not only that, women control 80% of consumer spending decisions. When there's women in senior roles, it decreases the bankruptcy risk of the company by 20%. It increases loyalty, innovation and productivity. Nonetheless, as a gender, we still face considerably discrimination. We have an unequal playing field, significantly less access to capital, and we don't earn the same salary for the same job. I would like to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and to talk about why this topic is important. Where do you want to start? I start with Katrin. Okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, and thank you to Caspian Week and Shireen for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Despina Panagiotou Theodosiu. I'm from Cyprus, uh, and I'm the CEO of a maritime technology company called Todotheo Maritime, and president of Women's International Shipping and Trading uh, Association, which is an, an organization with uh, 46 um, uh, member countries under its belt. Um, well, I think it's important because this is an issue I face every day. I have been very fortunate in my career to, to have been able to reach the promotion a C-level position. And, and I have been also very fortunate to work for, for an industry that I absolutely love. And I think this is one of my ways of giving back uh, to, to women in our industry, but also to our industry as a whole. Wonderful, thank you. My name is Alexandra Gonzala. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Caspian Week team for the very kind uh, invitation. Excuse me. Um, I am a CEO of Magpie Advisory. It is a geopolitical risk research and advisory firm. We're based in Miami, but have uh, operations here in Switzerland as well. And we work on advising large multinational corporations and governments on uh, country risk, sovereign risk, with a specific focus on on emerging emerging markets, particularly the African region. I'm a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council in, in Washington, D.C., and a lecturer here uh, at the University of St. Gallen. And um, I think this, re this topic is important for a lot, of, a lot of reasons, many of which Alba uh, mentioned in her opening remarks. I think the issue of women's leadership is interesting as well, because a lot of conversations, I think, in recent uh, years have spent a lot of time focusing on increasing uh, the number of women uh, in leadership positions. So grappling with that numerical fact, and perhaps less with what actually is women's leadership, what is leadership, and how can we proactively uh, inculcate and encourage that. Hello, thank you very much for being here. Shireen, thank you very much for the Caspian Week. Um, I'm Angie Hartman. I'm Executive Vice President of uh, uh, Crew Affairs of Starbuck. Uh, we manage and own, own over 130 vessels. Uh, we have uh, over 2,500 uh, seafarers, uh, 2,500 to 3,000. We have our own office in the Philippines. Uh, this is one of my responsibilities, uh, dealing with the crew. Uh, multiple, multi, multiple crew, uh, which is a difficult task, but it's a very uh, productive. Um, I would say that uh, also I'm a um, president of Wista Hellas. <coughs> uh, we have our Wista International uh, president here, and uh, la uh, recently I was also uh, I became a executive uh, board member of International. So in, indeed, the recent study, this I have to read because I, I'm not good in uh, remembering statistics, okay. So indeed, the recent study, which was conducted by McKinsey Global Institute in 2000, uh, 2015, brought uh, out uh, poten potentiality for improving the GDP to a higher level. The report st stresses out that um, if women who account for half of the world's working force do not achieve their full economic potential, the global economy will suffer. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you to Caspian Week for hosting us. My name is Soleima. I was born and raised in Morocco. Um, and today, I'm the CEO and the founder of a fintech company called Comgo, active in the blockchain space, in the commodity space. Um, I have a very strong financial background, having spent 18 years with the French bank Société Générale that I left last year to launch this company. Um, why am I here today? I think it's... In the, if you look at the financing world, the banking industry and the IT industry, uh, this women in, in, in leading position is still a very big topic. And uh, compared to when I started working almost 20 years ago, I don't think it's moving in the right directions. And we were comparing our industries before. Um, <laughs> banking is becoming less and less friendly for, for women in, in leading positions, obviously. And I don't even mention the IT dimension here. Um, I was also very fortunate as an African woman to be able to uh, do what I did. And I think what you mentioned before is key, giving back and supporting others. And, and being a role model is a very important uh, motivation, too. Thank you very much. My name is Maria Koteneva. I'm coming from Moscow. Uh, I have studied the best uh, university, the University of Foreign Affairs, and studied uh, international economy. I have studied also later at the Humboldt University in Berlin, uh, Germanistic. But uh, I have married a diplomat, so that's why my life was uh, in between business and looking for jobs, because <laughs> the, uh, the uh, diplomat life is, consisted, is consistent of three and four years period where you have to bring it together, family life and uh, business life. And uh, uh, being the wife of the ambassador, I was the first lady from our country and it was also a great thing to uh, to in in leadership i think for for women and uh, uh 2008 uh, my husband and me were the founders of uh, a new conference a new generation uh, russia germany and now it is uh, a really great uh, platform for leadership in Europe and uh, uh, a, uh, more, of course for Germany and Russia. I would be happy to say later a little bit more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon for me as well. I'm Katerina Stathopoulou. Thank you for uh, the invitation and to Caspian Week. I am from Athens, Greece. I've been in shipping uh, for the past 34 years, in shipping finance for the past 34 years. I've been in shipping all my life, as I am the daughter, uh, the proud daughter of a ship's captain. Um, and uh, finance um, is my passion and shipping as well. I have been on the board of Wista International for six years, stepped down this year, and. Uh, uh, Angie uh, joined. I am a member of WISTILAS. I am a mentor to the young generation. I am a shipping finance lecturer for um, Institute of Chartered Ship Brokers. And um, I am very um, enthusiastic about the topic. And I am here, and it's important for me because I believe that uh, we need to be role models and for everything else. Uh, the previous lady said we need to be role models and take this forward as I am also and finally the proud mother of two young ladies um, so they are now in the uh, business industry just launching their own careers so we need to hand over the baton and help them pave the way for a better smaller gender gap thank you thank you Hi everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Hua Fan, I'm from Beijing, China. Uh, I grew up there um, and then studied mathematics in college. After college, I, spent, I went to uh, US and then get my PhD in finance. And then I spent about uh, like 10 years at Goldman Sachs, um, I mean, um, running their like, a global risk modeling group. And then 2007, I went back to China and then later on joined the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, CIC. Uh, 
CIC was founded then, and then so we were uh, building it up like a startup. Uh, right now, CIC manages about uh, 900 billion US dollar, uh, where I'm more responsible for uh, is the 250 billion dollar uh, overseas investments. Um, um, why the women's leadership topic is quite important, uh, I think I can quote a story. Uh, recently, in the Chinese social media, uh, which is called WeChat, we, uh, currently it has about uh, 1 billion people uh, logging in every month to use it. Uh, so on this uh, WeChat thing, and then there was this uh, uh, popular uh, message and then talking about uh, uh, Chinese women work more than uh, French men. Um, and then the story was like this. Um, well, everybody knows like Chinese uh, China has this uh, higher GDP rate, which is uh, something come to 6.6 percent, uh, uh, and then that comes. Uh, um, uh, that will give credit to the labor participants rates. Uh, uh, for the Chinese men, the rate was like 90 percent, one of the highest, uh, joined by uh, Philip, uh, Philippines, Mexico, Brazil. But uh, everybody probably didn't know that much. Uh, the difference coming from women. Women participants rate is about 70 percent, which is like a 10 percent higher than. The, the second to next, uh, uh, which is Canada, which comes about 60%. Uh, uh, so I think we have a lot to gain if we can all encourage more women to work and then more women to become leaders. Thank you. Well, um, I don't know if you heard well, but Dr. Fan is responsible for $250 billion of investment. <laughs> so um, I want to ask her, um, you know, when, uh, when the majority of women that experience the the glass ceiling, you know, the being discriminated just for being a woman, they tend to demotivate themselves and stop aspiring to climb the corporate ladder. What happened, what personal experience you had that kept you going and kept you motivated to seek for the C-suite? <laughs> well, uh, I worked in both U.S. and in China. So uh, when I was with uh, Goldman, uh, it definitely was the case with, uh, I felt like there is some kind of a glass ceiling, but I, I still sort of uh, try to do my best. And at least, I mean, I was able to uh, become um, I'm recognized uh, and then running <coughs> a 20 plus people. Um, but still, I guess maybe because I, I sort of in Philippines feel there's this glass ceiling and then I chose, went back to, uh, to go back to China and then join a Chinese firm. Uh, and then where we felt like a ceiling is a little bit higher. Uh, so there um, <coughs> we were able to uh, build up teams from scratch and then, um, I mean, doing well in the fund management industry. Um, I, th I think, I mean, when it comes to me, I felt like you just uh, go ahead and do it, do it your best. And then I think if you do a good job, you will be recognized. But on the other hand, uh, uh, the training, um, I mean, at Goldman uh, was helping uh, quite uh, quite a bit because there were um, like women's uh, leadership trainings at Goldman, which I think I benefited quite a lot. Uh, uh, there are definitely techniques that we could uh, use uh, to, to become more recognizable by others. Thank you. How about you? Um, what triggered me? Well, um, first of all, I have to say, I don't think it's only uh, a gender issue. Uh, I think it's also a character issue. You need to want it and you need to have the character to be able to go after it. And growing up, I, I have to say, I was an athlete in a male-dominated sport. I did judo for 20 years and I was an international athlete. So. Um, what we did was train and go there to win. That's the mentality I, I had growing up. Um, and this, is, this was the only way for me to continue the sport I loved. I couldn't uh, take um, second best. And, and also growing up, uh, during training, I also used to fight with men. And it didn't matter. Uh, other weight categories, it didn't matter. You just had to do it. Uh, so I think this mentality spilled over into my life after sports. Um, I am quite ambitious um, as a character and, and I couldn't imagine going to work every day and not having an ambition or, no, or not having a higher goal. Um, so I, I think it's also a, a big part of, of, of your character and it's okay if, if you don't have that character trait, it's absolutely okay. But um, I think it takes that both in men and in women. Thank you. 
Hey, Alexandra? Um, I'd actually like to pick up a little bit on, on what you said in terms of character, but also uh, in some of the other things that have been mentioned in terms of role models. So actually, um, during my formative schooling years, I guess, if you will, between the ages of 10 and 18, I spent in an all-girls school. Um, and so for me, that was significant insofar as all of the leadership positions, whether it was president of the student body, the captain of the, of the soccer team, what have you, those were all women. And I assumed some of those positions as well. So as I progressed through my uh, personal and, and professional life, for me, that was a, a very powerful young impression. And it was impossible that a woman couldn't lead this or lead that because I saw it when I was 10 years old. So I think it's also those early impressions and um, early role models that really for me was quite formative in uh, in my career also going forward which is not to say that we should be shipping girls off to all girls schools <laughs> no, no, no. but but those early impressions i think are important are very important yes. thank you angie i was very fortunate i did not um, go through um, gender bias uh, working for a family business i was very fortunate to be given the chance to prove myself so they threw me in the deep so the only way to make it was through hard work, re earn people's respect, go on board the vessels and see how people live, what are their problems, go to the Philippines, go to Russia, go to whatever, multicultural crew, uh, stay way, uh, late at work, climb the ladder while the vessel is in the anchorage. This is proving yourself that you can make it. So it's through being persistent, patient and hard work. Um, I think it's both, and for men and for women, a glass ceiling. It doesn't matter if it's a man or, or a woman. Thank you. Maybe to add to what has just been said, um, culture and education. I come from a family where women have always to showed me and told me that I could do whatever I wanted in my life. And this was a huge opportunity and gave me a lot of trust in myself. Um, teams, I have... For me, everything comes from the team, and I have been pushed a lot by my teams to, to be there today. I, wa I was the one that was there to represent them, so very important. And obviously, I, I fully agree with what you said in terms of hard work, in terms of passion, in terms of commitment. Um, I don't completely agree on the fact that it's the same thing for men and women. Definitely, it's not the case. I'm, I mean, coming from the finance industry, in finance, some women work night and day, and they never go anywhere, and some men don't and they just promote it. So I really saw this big difference in the, in the banking industry, definitely. And, uh, and I think it's important to, to, I mean, there's still a, bit, a lot of challenges there, definitely. Thank you. Maria? Oh. Well, I'm, uh, I come from Moscow, and I had one of the best Moscow schools. And just to you want to understand, we, ha we were 40 in the class, and there were 26 girls. So, of course, well, <laughs> by the way, it's, uh, well, the situation, the modern situation in Russia, when we have 20 million more uh, women than men, and uh, we have, for every seven uh, uh, women, we have only six men. So, it's, it's the, uh, the modern situation, and you just have to understand it, that if you are so many, you have to, to go through this. Yes, you have to be bold, you have to, to have the strong character just to, to come out of and to be, to be the better, to, to be better than those men who also try to get the same position in, uh, uh, in business life. So, well, for me, uh, well, it's, uh, it's an interesting question and uh, I think uh, every country has uh, its peculiarities and uh, you told us, well, because, for example, you said uh, that in China most of the women uh, are working and this percentage is larger uh, than uh, the rate in the world. The rate in the world is 40%. And uh, in the Soviet Union we had 94% uh, 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 the rate. Absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely. Well, they, difficult, they difficult. On purpose, yes, missed that. yes. <laughs> difficult, difficult to well to understand it. But today, it's also ninety percent in Russia because uh, well, I, I just don't want to speak so long. But we can uh, uh, come to it afterwards. Okay, um, they've more or less covered uh, my part. <coughs> but what I would like to say is my challenge 
did, I was very fortunate, my challenge not to come from the business industry, but to come from very early years, and that was my culture and my family, unbelievably enough, not anymore. Um, I am Greek born, but American, American raised and educated. So at the time when I was 18 years old and I uh, told my parents I'm going to be in the finance uh, sector and in the shipping finance sector, coming from a shipping family and a dad on the ships, everybody said, no, 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 you cannot do that. It is totally male dominated, which was the case. Now we are actually talking about mid 80s, okay? So um, they said, no, you can't. And to me, no, you can't has always been to my character a very red flag. <laughs> so I was always, so it is character. It is, I cannot accept, I can't do something. I, you need to tell me how I can do it and I will try my best. And I won't be always the best, but that's okay as well. So once I got through to the, over the hurdle of my family, proving to them that I can do, and I can do more than that, um, then within the business, I was very fortunate. So I had good role models from the men. I had support in the shipping, in the finance sector, uh, which I agree with you, it is very difficult, uh, within a shipping company and then within the banking sector. And then I decided to jump out and become an advisor in the shipping finance um, sphere for the past 18 years, which I face hurdles every day, meaning 34 year of track record, and I still have to prove myself every day to my clients, but my male colleagues also have to do that as well. So it, it is character, it is passion, it is need, wanting to go forward, and yes, I agree, you do not need to have it, it's okay. So it's everybody has their own ways and wants in going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And now first, uh, go with Suleiman, the center. So now we, we have to propose solutions. What, would, what do you think countries and companies have to do, have to implement to really make a difference? And what are you doing yourself to make a difference? I'm, I, to be very transparent, I'm not a big fan of, of positive action and positive measures to make this happen. I'm a very strong believer in, in driving teams by performance and, uh, and behavior. Um, having said that, and having said what I said before, I think nevertheless, some things have to be done. Education, training, you mentioned some before. Uh, mentoring, sponsorship, role models, these are things that can help a lot. Uh, recruitment policy, being sure that you gather enough CVs from all genders before choosing, um, and uh, and paying a specific attention to women in in all the complexity uh, the, their life can carry. Um, for example, I'm I have somebody in my team today who comes from India, from a. Uh, not the best uh, uh, social uh, layer of India, and uh, and she's an amazing performer. And and I'm, if I wouldn't be helping her, she wouldn't be in the company anymore because of her cultural background. So this extra attention you can bring to your stuff as a manager, I, I really try to do that as much as I can for women. That's amazing, Angie. How about you? Okay, um, being the president of Western Halas, okay, because I think this is more um, important. Um, we, we no. <laughs> okay. it's, uh, it's, it takes too long. <laughs> Next time. Next time you invite us. Um, what we do is the following. Uh, uh, okay, WESA stands for Women International Shipping and Trading Association. Of course, Vespina will tell you more. She's the international president, so I don't want to take her. Uh, so what we do is the following. We have uh, almost more than 280 uh, members in Greece. We are the second NWA. Uh, the US is the first one. Uh, we have uh, monthly gatherings and we talk about um, shipping, uh, various um, uh, aspects. Um, we do a lot of forums, which uh, brings a lot of people from shipping, uh, come together and it's a, a brainstorming. And um, we have also uh, Rista International worldwide, where we exchange uh, ideas. So what we do, try to do is to try to educate our people, exchange ideas, uh, definitely, uh, we try to uh, assist them. Uh, we're not uh, a place that you find, you, you know, you come to find a job, right? Um, but we try to um, assist our, our um, members. So I think this is a way of 
changing the minds and assisting and reinforcing the woman in Thank you, Angie. How about you, um, Alexandra? What are you doing to make a difference? Sure. Um, well, my I'm in the policy politics world, and a challenge um, that we have among many is that within the policy world, women work to a certain point, and then when they're a family and so on, then they'll either take an extended leave or just drop out completely, and then they struggle to come back. And many conversations about that attribute that, for instance, to the challenge of being a child uh, or a caregiver and uh, and a breadwinner. But there was actually an interesting study that came out uh, about a few years ago done by an Oxford colleague of mine. Um, and she surveyed women between the ages of 30 and 40 who were leaving the workforce. And she looked into why that was. And it challenged the assumptions of um, having to balance work and life. And she, that study found that most women between the ages of 30 and 40 who are leaving the workforce in the policy sphere and others are leaving because of insufficient pay and a lack of learning and uh, opportunities for professional development. And that study found that men between the ages of 30 and 40 are leaving for more or less the same reason. So I think the challenge for organizations is really to provide pay fairly and to provide opportunities for training and role models and, and some of the things that have been mentioned before. I think, um, interestingly, if we're thinking specifically about millennial women, millennial women, the millennial generation is the purpose generation, so on and so forth, insofar that the, the passion or the drive for work is not necessarily just the paycheck, but something more meaningful. Um, and so I think for organizations, the challenge is to create that kind of work environment. And so uh, I, I bring on many young research assistants, many young analysts, and it's really about building up and supporting the, the best and the brightest and opening doors for them. Because a challenge, I think, in the policy world and others as well, is that women generally don't have access to many informal networks as men still do in terms of opportunities to meet mentors or, or meet people that might put them in the right place at the right time, so to speak. So opening those kind of doors is, I think, also hugely important uh, for, for everybody. Mentoring is Mentoring. very important. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. what do you think? Um, well, I'll talk about my company first, what we do, and, and then I can talk a little bit about what we're doing on, on the international level. But um, when I reached the C-level of my company, I was not initially the CEO, I was uh, the CFO. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to promote not only women, but also younger people, because we were quite an aging, um, and actually it's a group of companies, so it was a quite aging group of companies. Um, today I'm happy to say that um, we're uh, approximately 50-50 and, and also for women in the mid um, uh, management levels. On the senior management levels uh, we have 30% women, a little bit over 30, which is not 50, but it's much more than what it used to be a few years ago, so we're getting there. And we're also very mindful of uh, how we pay people, so people get the same salary for the same job. Um, so, th this is a rule, uh, and I, s I have seen through the years that um, you don't have to tell people that you have to respect your female colleagues or you have to promote them. I I if it comes from the top of the company and it's um, ingrained within the culture, then it comes naturally. Yeah. Um, when it comes to, to WISA International, well, we are um, a 45-year-old organization, a global organization. And to be honest, until a few years ago, we didn't have the opportunities to promote women in shipping as much as we do today. Um, last year, uh, the IMO, it's a, the International Maritime Organization, and it's the UN Agency for Shipping, they approved us uh, for consultative status, which shows uh, how much uh, perception is changing in the shipping industry. And actually this year, the Maritime Day theme is called Empowering Women in the Maritime Community. Um, we have seen such a change in only a few years. We have major shipping companies all over the world calling us and say, come in and help us improve our diversity rates. A mentor are the women that we believe are going higher. Um, our role as WISTA is not to tell the industry what to do, but our role is to 
uh, provide the industry with the resources and the tools it needs uh, to push us towards uh, true gender diversity. And it's working. We see education, we see mentoring. Uh, education is a big component, I believe. Um, if, if, the, if part of the question is if we believe in quotas, personally I don't. I believe in meritocracy, so I don't believe in quotas. But I believe in supporting women and supporting young children um, by allowing them uh, to have ambition, by inspiring them, by providing them the education to go uh, places. I would like to add here, if I, if I may, mm -hmm. that in Greece at least, uh, uh, I mean, on board vessels now, you, you do see quite a few women. So this is a great change. Mm -hmm. We've seen a woman captain, Iakinthi, uh, on board a tanker vessel. Uh, I, I think in Japan also they had now a woman uh, Captain, yes. so at least in shipping, we can see that things are changing. Yes. We're all considering of uh, putting women on board the vessel. Okay, it takes time. There are a lot of things that you have to uh, fix in order to, to have a healthy and, yes. and productive in environment, but we do see it uh, changing in shipping. I mean, that is great news. And <laughs> Maria? Uh, what's special about Moscow? What's Moscow doing in terms of uh, empowerment? What are you doing on your own? Yeah, I, I, uh, I have already said that we have uh, the equality in education out in our country. But what I uh, really love to say that uh, the sociological so tests show us that the women know that already, that the, the society is developing faster. So, for example, there are 90% uh, of uh, women in our country are absolutely sure of it. They, they know that they have the same uh, possibilities than uh, the other gender. And at the same time, uh, uh, this development shows us that they are also sure that they can get uh, in their profession a very good position. Uh, almost 76% uh, of women in our country are now um, absolutely sure of that. And also they think that uh, they have the right to have uh, the same um, uh, remuneration as men. And it is also, well, the uh, absolutely new development in our country. Uh, I'm well, I, I, I know the banking sector is not the best in the world if we take this question of equality, and, uh, but it is uh, an international problem, and I think maybe with the time it would be uh, solved and uh, there would be uh, women, uh, more women on their SCI force, and uh, um, well, in, a, in any way we have now women also in such, uh, in Russia, in such closed uh, uh, professional society as uh, diplomacy. We have uh, many women ambassadors now, also from our country. So it is also a development, a nice development. Thank you. Women are more flexible and more diplomatic, I would yeah. say. Yes, they That's are. why. <laughs> yes, yeah. they are. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right. And, and maybe you. one uh, <laughs> sentence more. Uh, women are working very hard, you know, and uh, uh, we have really, we're working through uh, the whole uh, life hard at, in our families, uh, in our profession. And men who are uh, leading the companies, uh, they know it. And sometimes they take women because they know they, they are hard workers. We're taking over. <laughs> no, 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 no. And how about Greece? What are you doing? Um, well, Greece um, and Angie covered what we do with WISTA. I believe that uh, Greece is going forward on the education level. Um, and I personally believe that education and transparency for um, breaking the stereotypes into younger generation education to start from basics and allow the children to think as a culture that you can do more things. I mean, if you, if you have a girl say, I would like to be an airplane pilot, and they would go, go for it, okay? So we're trying to break the stereotypes uh, through education, and within the shipping industry, we are working hard to empower all the uh, ladies and women through education, mentoring, and networking. Now, in our co on my company, um, we are a small company, but uh, we have 
uh, a 50 50 uh, an uh, analogy of women and uh, men and we now recruit or we have been recruiting younger generation which we've been assisting to grow so the management level and the experience we have because as advisors it is a you know you need it's a well-rounded experience to give forward for somebody to be to grow into the company and to be able to be productive so we are now um, taking on new generation and um, we are very flexible with the women with me as an example to assist them in the working hours and the work-life balance so I raised two children as a single parent, not always being in the office, but being very effective. So uh, that can be done. And I think if companies put that into their policy, uh, that will definitely assist the, uh, the whole issue. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very curious to, know, to learn what's China doing in this respect. Um, first, I would echo uh, with the education uh, perspective. Uh, when we were uh, growing up, um, I mean, we were told, well, uh, women hold half of the sky. That's what mm -hmm. Chairman Mao uh, said before. Uh, so we didn't have that much restrictions of what, whatever things we couldn't be. Um, in terms of uh, uh, school, and right now we have we started seeing like elementary school girls have higher scores than men, and then move on to high school and now even college. Uh, um, so, so in some of the admission offices, sometimes they have to adjust uh, the, the admission scores lower for men, uh, which is somehow probably unheard of uh, I mean, many years ago. Um, but still, we still have the challenges. The higher you move, and the little women, the, the few women you will see. Um, so one thing I think people still uh, do is, at certain levels, they will require a certain number of women on board, or maybe on the um, <coughs> um, political um, arrangement. Um, um, I know it's not perfect, and then, but still, I think it's a, it's a step. Maybe we could get some people recognized that way. Um, and then, um, in terms of what I did, um, at least I hire more women. Um, but it's not because I just like women. I think they, they are better uh, producers. Uh, and then they provide a very good diversification in asset management. Uh, uh, as most of you probably know, um, diversification is the only French, uh, free lunch in asset management. And then having more <laughs> women uh, on, on the team, like they we produce uh, pretty good long-term results. Um, and then we do see uh, there are mid-level managers saying, oh, I mean, they might be um, having kids and then missing for like a few months. And then some people say, well, we don't want to hire, hire women. But actually, uh, my own experience is that they tend to be more loyal and stick longer, and it turn out to, to be great uh, for, for our team. So um, I would encourage everybody to do the same. <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Now, um, this is an interesting topic. Um, often, toxic workplace cultures become perpetuated in traditionally male-dominated environments, where performance and commitment are measured by the hours put into the job, the time that the employee leaves the office, the late hours of the night that work emails have been sent, or the weekends that are spent working. This situation creates an artificial expectation and false performance indicators that are impossible to manage around other family commitments. And often, this falls into women who are proven to carry the mental load of the family. How do you consider the future of the workplace would impact the gender gap? We start here to here. Okay. <clears throat> well, I, I would say that uh, the role of the family in society is, is hugely important. In, in some cultures, you see bigger, comp uh, bigger families that have big support from the family around them. And then in some other cultures, you know, the family is really a very small core and they get uh, state support, let's say. Um, but I think in societies that have an increasingly smaller uh, core as a family, it's very important um, uh, to promote ways to move away f uh, from this um, uh, toxic environment. Um, I would say 
you know, promoting ways of sharing this work at home is, is, is one of the best things. It's not only about working late hours, but it's having the ability to share the workload at home. And some countries are already embracing this. And, and for example, I know in Sweden, um, the state gives collective parental leave days and, and the couple can decide how to split, split it among this, themselves. Um, Society is changing and more and more men want to be more involved in their families' lives, in their children's lives. Uh, and I think this is something we should encourage and promote. Um, as long as the responsibilities are, are at home become increasingly shared, then I think women will also have the opportunity uh, to raise their profile and get more opportunities um, in the workplace. That's great, you know, because it's very complicated to spend long hours and then taking care of your family, yes. and then you have to take care of your husband, then you have to care, take care of the it's the kids and all the responsibilities, and then you have to network, right? So yeah. <laughs> when do you, would you find the time, right? But I, I, I do want to emphasize that we should not... Um, not diminish, but we should, we should not underestimate the need of the men as well to be close to their families, and I think that's the Correct. key. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is the good thing about women empowerment, that men also benefit. Because, you know, we live in this culture where men cannot cry, men cannot be with their children. You know, um, there's also a feminine side on, of men that you can express when, when we embrace women empowerment. What do you think about this, uh, Alexandra? Yeah, I'd actually like to pick up on that and maybe somewhat controversially push back a little bit <laughs> on it. And so far as I'm not necessarily sure that it's exactly a gender issue. And I say this as an example. Uh, there was, back in 2012, uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who was very high up in the foreign policy department on the Obama administration, a very successful professor, and I believe she still is in Princeton, at Princeton. She wrote an article for the Atlantic magazine that was entitled, Why Women Still Can't Have It All. And that kind of catapulted her into the spotlight on this issue, and she brought up many of the, <coughs> of the um, matters that we're discussing here. And shortly thereafter, there was uh, another article in The Atlantic written by a gentleman, I, I don't recall who, but ex-military, very successful. And the title of his piece was Men Still Can't Have It All Either. And in it, he went on to describe the trade-offs that men also have to make. More time in the office means less time at home with their families, with their wives, so on and so forth. So the burden might fall a little bit more to, to women in some cases, but I don't see it as, as a gender issue. Um, in terms of what can be done, I, I agree with the societal change and that it's progressing uh, in, in the right direction. And I think also within the workplace, um, you're, we're seeing changes as well. More companies are starting to uh, embrace flex time or work for ho from home and focusing more on, on the actual quality of the deliverable rather than how many hours someone clocks um, at his or or her desk. And I think over time as well, as we start to see the emergence of this kind of gig economy, if you will, that may give um, both women and men the flexibility to arrange their, their professional lives and their personal lives in a way that are um, kind of healthy and holistic for both. Thank you. Angie? Okay, uh, maybe I'm repeating myself, but as I said before, uh, shipping, uh, I mean, has uh, traditionally been a dominating uh, male. Uh, uh, but as I said before, this is changing. Um, on, on board the ships, there's no uh, nine to five, okay? And uh, th things are very uh, particular. For example, even if you're not sure, um, they can call you Christmas Eve, they can call you Easter, the time that you're with your family and having Easter. Uh, but uh, we've seen that with uh, digitization and things are changing because now women can be more it's more easy for the woman to be involved and on shore and on the ships. Um, so uh, what, I would, what I would really say is that on board the vessels, the regulations are very, very strict. Uh, the rest hours of all the crew and all recorded by the master. So digitalization, as I said before, is transforming uh, business landscapes and the world of work and, and redefining the boundaries of production, consumption and distribution. The shipping industry is currently facing a new challenge, modern ships, automation. Highly automated, most systems or <coughs> components will be linked with the near future to the internet. So uh, bottom line, I would say that uh, technological advancements will bring to the shipping industry many changes and this will, be, uh, held, this will help bridge the, um, the gap with men and women. 
Thank you, Andy. And Suleyma, I think in, the, in your industry, you know, it's particularly toxic, you know, because it's very, you know, how many hours you work, if you work in the weekend, how do you deal with that? I have been into a very toxic department during six years, actually, and I have had made, and it was my first job, my two first jobs, and I did make the conscious choice not to apply to those rules and to leave the office when I was fed up, when I couldn't be productive anymore, when I needed some fresh air. And believe me that it was kind of a tough period for me and I had to prove even more because I was doing that so I was very much I was more challenged than the other people because I was doing that um, so but, but there are two different things I think we're mentioning here there's the, those pure toxic workplace and I think there are less and less places like that today yes uh, because of all you've mentioned because today I'm in a blockchain based company one of the keywords of blockchain is decentralization obviously everybody works from a decentralized space in our environment so things are changing mm -hmm. but there's a, another thing it's when you reach to the sea level you have to be very conscious of the fact that as a leader of a company, um, you need to be everywhere. And you, you said it both at the beginning, you have to, uh, to, you have to desire this position and to take it exactly. only if you are ready to be everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you don't think of it before, it's, it's right. a disaster after. Okay. I mean, I'm never at home. Uh, I <laughs> took this position um, knowing that I would never be at home. Uh, my daughters knew it, my husband knew it. Um, it was a collective decision in, in the family. And if, if you want to be a leader and if you want to perform in such roles, it's, you have no other choice. And it's not a question of toxic or not, it's a question of driving businesses, that's all. Um, this is what I can add to Maybe you, we can say that you have to decide which are your priorities, yeah. right? Yeah. We're not all the and same. And priorities change yeah. as the family moves on. And then, you know, it's, it's a balance. And clearly, in my case, it was very important for me not to have my chi children raised by somebody else. Exactly. Uh, except by my husband or myself. And my husband did a conscious choice to stop working. And he's managing the family today. And he would have not done that. <laughs> I would not be here today, definitely. If I, if I may add, if I may add, if you don't have the support of the family, it's a lost it, case. Yeah. For example, the seafarers in general, right? They need the full support, and I'm sure Katerina understands that because her father was a master. So if you don't have the, the support from your family behind, let's say for the wife, from the wife, who is a supporter behind, you know, uh, taking care of the kids? And she's the one who deals with the finance, by the way, at least in the Greek uh, society, and uh, making good, you know, um, economic uh, budget and supporting and helping the husband who's on board the ship and feels very lonely and I'm sure he's uh, homesick but she's the one who's, who supports him to be able to continue so I think the family support is the most is important issue. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So how do you deal with your kids? You know, when you said like priorities change, why do you mean by that? Oh, yes. <laughs> First of all, what I'd like to say and I will get to that because to me it was the most important choice I made, priorities uh, between my children and the speed of my progress in uh, business. So um, what I want to say is that once you have a family and once you know what you want to do uh, and wherever your life brings you, because I started off as a married couple raising kids, at some point in time I got divorced, okay, it happens, that's life. Um, and then in the Greek culture, the, um, the, the burden for the kids is on the mother, okay? Which is changing, but it's still on the mother. So um, the father well, did not want to participate that much. So then I had to have a career choice of how fast would I be progressing against being 100% with my children. And I believe I strike the balance with the assistance of two factors. My family, my parents, who as I said were the first that I had to break the glass ceiling with them, but they were very big supporters at that point of helping me with my children and not anybody else outside the family, for me to move on, but be with them as well, and my company that allowed me the time to be able to be with my children and at their activities while also being effective to what I need to do. And to that, help technology. So I could be at a parent-teacher's conference with my Blackberry, answering emails while I'm in the line 
waiting to speak. And in fact, I was the mother that was always, everybody knew that I was everywhere and all, all the time, but always with a headphone and always typing, but always attentive and present. So that made the children, A, independent, because they had to spend a lot of time on their own as well, for me to be able to network and progress. And as they were growing up, our priorities shifted. So I could be more away, although they were still in high school, than I was while they were in primary school. I could travel. Once they went to the university, I was free. I had no, I have no resemblance to a Greek mother. So they just okay. left on their own, and on the same day I would be flying for a WISTA international meeting when my elder daughter left. <laughs> on the same day, two hours later. So she went off to college, I went off to do my work, and they were all happy. And the younger one was home, staying at home alone to finish high school for a week or, you know, go to school. So it all, it can be done, and I feel technology is helping us more now towards that direction. So I was able to do it when technology was not that progressive, and it's just a short time. By the way, my children are 21 and 23, if anybody's wondering. <laughs> um, so, but now it's helping us more. So priorities do shift, but we need to be, as a person and as a woman and as a mother, very clear on who we are and what we want. And once we get, you know, one thing up, I, I had a priority list. And I am now at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Okay? Amazing. So I guess you can do have it all, but not at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> and you need and to be patient. Exactly. And but aware about the consequences and the and energy it takes. <laughs> uh, yes, of course. Thank you. But you, well, you need to understand that once you choose that, and then if you start, you know, if you're tired, you just move back a little bit. I would like to add here, if I may, uh, for example, Filipinos, right? Filipino family, uh, many times, you know, I have difficulty finding a master, a chief engineer, and it's something very, very urgent. What do I do? I call the wife, you know, and I say, please, persuade your husband to go on board. You know, I'll send you flowers, I'll do anything, <laughs> you know, whatever. And it, it happens. Yeah. So you're, you're absolutely right. We have to respect the timing exactly. of our life. Yeah. You know, and uh, Mary has an interesting story here because as being the <coughs> wife of a diplomat, she had to have a lot of flexibility and ability to change constantly. How do you deal, how do you took that to your personal life? Well, I think it was very important what you said because if you don't get the help of the family, and in my case, my parents helped me a lot, and I have, a, I have also a wonderful husband who was always on my side, and it was a, a wonderful balance in the family, and that you need just to go further in your life to find your, your way. And in any way, of course, uh, leadership is very important, and, uh, but the consequences are like that. You can't get uh, everything in your life. So, for example, it's also a, a large problem for uh, women in Russia because, uh, um, well, uh, the historic period shows us that the Russians wanted all, the Russian women all, all, always wanted a family. That's why we married so early. It was, uh, well, the family is really an important thing. And I hope it stays like that. Uh, but uh, the right balance is, uh, uh, well, our challenge today. Because everybody wants, of course, a, a very nice uh, position uh, in their business life. Uh, and at the same time, a nice family and good children. And that is uh, difficult really? to bring together. Uh, in my case, uh, I was just... Uh, uh, as, as I said, I, I had to uh, to look for jobs uh, every three, four years, and for me, it was just a nice thing to get a job, to have the possibility to do something not only in the family, though I, I love my family, of course, and I think it's also uh, the way of uh, just understanding what a woman can do, uh, and uh, we have so many qualities in us that we we can just have the possibility to show them, to bring them uh, uh, to other people and to help maybe other young girls uh, and young women to understand that uh, all the world is inside. 
we are we are the world we're just opening ourselves we, we, we just have to open the doors and not close them exactly. that's uh, that's the way to do it and back to the problems we have uh, maybe there is also a nice sentence to it we can say we can be in love uh, we have to come in love with this, uh, with this, not with the solution, but with the problem. Then, if we love it, then we love our place where we work. Okay. And if we are looking for, for work, then we don't have to say, oh, I like this place. No, but we have to say, I love it. And mm -hmm. then it is another atmosphere. And maybe, uh, well, I think it is a very important thing. Please listen to me love is a very important thing in our life not in our uh, private lives but also in our business life because when we are having this area of love around us uh, also to the people who are working with us then then it is a, a very special atmosphere and not anymore uh, well just just take a few steps to the other people ar around you but if you don't put effort and love yes. and passion, uh, yes. Greeks are very famous love for the passion. <laughs> passion, yes, um, and we're very we're never passionate. never good in anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> very, yeah. And our example, by the way, for women is Bubulina. My friend here told me, do you know Bubulina? Yes, so, of course. <laughs> you know, that was our example. You know, this is important because work, it's not only for remuneration. Yeah, work right. is also to do something that you're passionate about. So you can be a spouse, you can have your family, but you can also spend some time, even philanthropic time. It yeah. doesn't have to be something that gives you money, but gives you the, uh, the pleasure of contributing to society and of doing something that exactly. you love and keeps you passionate exactly. about. Um, and here, it's the, um, Dr. Hua's um, example is also you know, interesting because she's married and she has two kids and she's uh, not only surviving but thriving in the C-suite. I don't really know how she does that, you know. It costed my marriage. Uh, so, Well, um, I also made a choice. Uh, um, I uh, have two kids and then I choose uh, to send them to boarding schools at a very young age. Uh, it turned out to be great for both of us. Uh, they turn, they, because in China, uh, it's quite common for uh, parents to helping kids with their homeworks. You know, Chinese have lots of homeworks. Uh, <laughs> and then the, the teachers even just send like a direct homeworks to the parents helping them. I mean, ask them to help with their children. Um, and then I thought about it and I said, oh, when I grow up, I didn't have my parents helping me with the homeworks. I think if the kids are motivated enough, they should be able to handle themselves. Uh, so I made a choice as I'm to boarding school and then I told them, you, you guys just take care of yourself. Uh, uh, and then I can be with my work. Uh, and then and it turned out to be uh, also helping in the sense, I mean, maybe we have a less conflict between me and my kids during the weekdays. And then we can spend more like a quality time on, on the weekends. Uh, other uh, advice would be, um, I guess the younger generation have their own way to communicate. Uh, sometimes uh, if we're both at home, and they might be just in their rooms and not interacting with us. Uh, um, but on the other hand, maybe when I'm traveling, I can still like text them and then interact uh, with them. Uh, and they tell me lots of things uh, just on the WeChat. Uh, um, so it's more about uh, quality uh, and then less about like a FaceTime. Um, same for work, uh, probably give more um, like for results um, instead of uh, like a FaceTime at work. Well, that's true. Like quality is more important than quantity. I, I do agree with that. And uh, well, they say that for women to be empowered, you need to empower yourself first because we have a lot of self-esteem issues since we were, were very young because we are discouraged from leadership roles early on. So um, they tell us, you know, the only thing that matters is to find a husband or yeah. <laughs> you only have to care about your makeup. Don't worry about math, you know. Um, so I would like to know how do you dealt with your self-esteem and how do you dealt with your empowering to become the woman that you're today? Well, um, I guess I didn't do that much uh, special things, um, but I still uh, would emphasize what uh, the sort of the training courses I, t I took at Goldman. Uh, first of all, you probably need to choose it yourself. And like, it's not like uh, in Chinese schools, I mean, uh, all the classes or things are assigned to you. 
if you are sort of eager to learn things, and then you probably have to take a step yourself first. Uh, but then at Goldman, there were things like uh, um, trainings for new employees, uh, for, for the project managers, uh, for the new managers, and then later on uh, for senior management. Uh, and then step by step, and then there are sort of things, I mean, that could be helpful. And it helped me understand myself and also understand my manager's view. So, um, I mean, having thinking from the other one's perspective will be quite important. Um, and then managing other people's expectations could be quite important, as we were talking about uh, the work-life balancing. Um, I mean, don't make people think you're supposed to work really long hours uh, to start with, I would say. Thank you. So, Katerina. So you uh, experienced the glass ceiling very young with your family, telling you you were crazy, that that was impossible. I should have been married at 18. <laughs> <laughs> My mother had the husband out the door, and I jumped the window on the back of the house, literally. Yep. So tell us more about it. And tell me, uh, how did you, um, I mean, do you have a role model, or who inspired you to keep going? Actually, a man. <laughs> um, my first uh, employer who um, at the age of 20, I knocked on the door of a very big uh, shipping company and uh, pitched myself at the age of 20, again, for assistant CFO. I was still in the university. So um, he was a banker from Citibank. Uh, he had come out of, uh, he was resident vice president of Citibank at that time, head of shipping. And he was CFO of a Greek, uh, very big uh, Greek shipping company. And here we were in shipping in the 80s in the big crisis. So owners were taking on ex-bankers to help them resolve their financial issues. And here's a little 20-year-old knocking on the door for uh, the position of assistant CFO and um, pitched for it, literally. And no experience, nothing. I was just studying uh, financial management. I had two more years in the university. One hour interview, I have never had a, a more intense interview since then. And at the end of the interview, he says, where do you see yourself in five years? Can you imagine what I answered? <laughs> His chair. <laughs> I said, I'm going to be sitting in your chair in five years. And he said, you're hired. That's good. Eh? I said, thank you. You're not afraid of your chair. No, we, we started kidding with each other. And he says, no, because in five years, you need to be married, have children, be at home. And I said, okay. I, this is the second time I'm going through this, so I have it now. <laughs> um, I said, fine. I'm hired, right? He said, yes. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I, let's put a bet that in five years, I may be married, I may have children, but I will be sitting in your chair. Um, and um, let's see where that takes us. Actually, we became, yeah, I was. I left the company because I didn't want his chair. I wanted to move on. I wanted to be a head of shipping in, uh, in a bank at that point. So in five years, I knocked on his door and said, I don't want your chair anymore. <laughs> I am moving on. Um, so he became my, he, uh, my best friend, my best mentor. Uh, he, for those first five years, he was dropping me in the middle of the ocean into the deepest end of any project and I would come out swimming and not even, you know, breathing hard. But I put in very long hours, very big dedication, but I was learning. So um, what kept inspiring me was him. In five years, he said, when I knocked on his door and said, I don't want your chair anymore. I'm getting married, by the way, uh, I told him. But uh, I don't want your chair. I'm moving on. He supported me. He kept next to me all the time. And through this process, where I went into the banking, I uh, built up two banking portfolios as a woman in Greece, and uh, then jumped into the advisory, every male colleague I had, somehow um, I became very good friends, and they became my mentors, and I kept going up. So I consider myself very fortunate on that. It's not. It's rare, okay? But I think I won it, I earned it, with very big dedication, very, very hard work, long hours, but balancing everything somehow. So that's it. I'm finished with that now, so I'm very happy I managed it. And one last thing, and I think Daspina can say that as well as women. Um, as I said, when I did it alone with the kids, when they were young, 
they were with me everywhere, close to everywhere, okay? Wherever I could, even in business and in the office on the days they didn't have uh, school. That also helped the children grow independently, do their homework on their own, have self-esteem, and being a role model is not here I am, I'm your role model. You just do what you do, and you let the young generation see that, collect it, and put it into perspective and accept it or deny it. Thank you. You know, it's very important that you mentioned mentorship uh, because that is crucial for a, a female career. You know, a lot of the um, top women, they mentioned that they had a, um, a very strong male supporter. For example, Malala, no? she had her father and a lot of women have mentors. I mean, you don't really have, need to have female mentor. It can be a man and that, that helps a lot. How about you, Mary? You had a mentor or a role model? Uh, well, yes, my mentor was my husband <laughs> wow. during my life. And, uh, well, I, I think, uh, you know, um, it's, uh, well, if you, if you want, uh, you are, we are speaking about uh, our qualities, what, what brought us to, to be on this level. And I think there are also a lot of uh, feelings that are, um, well, inside of everyone, uh, when you are afraid, when you are coming to this sea level, it's also something which, uh, well, you wanted, but at the same time you think, oh, and when, and what, and uh, uh, that's why I think uh, there are, for example, I have this uh, second profession of me, linguistics, yes, and uh, um, I was uh, mostly afraid to go as a teacher for the first time in the class because uh, uh, it is a, a, a very special thing when you see 30 children before you and you have to be everything for them and after that you don't you are not afraid of you are afraid of nothing you see, because uh, this is a, a special thing, uh, being uh, well, a teacher is, uh, uh, in, in life is uh, uh, an actor, uh, a person, a philosopher, it's, uh, um, well, everything. So uh, for me, it's also this uh, development of character. When I came to Berlin as the wife of the ambassador, I was not afraid because uh, af after my life, uh, well, uh, two, two years, Yes, I think I was at school, but it was life, a large life that I, that I had. So, um, and uh, now with our uh, foundation, this is Association, Independent Associ Association, a New Generation Russia, uh, Germany, and uh, there are young people between 25 and 40, and I insist that's the most interesting period uh, in our lives because uh, you are just out of the university, maybe you are are already in our modern life in the 21st century you are already having your own startup or uh, stay, uh, standing uh, with both feet in your business life or, or cultural life I don't know uh, and uh, it is the possibility to uh, bring them also the possibilities of leadership uh, in life because they are studying in this uh, small uh, well small world of two countries Germany and Russia to be a, a, a leader and to know how much it depends on every person that every person uh, is very important uh, for this new technological way, uh, um, uh, society that we are having now. And, uh, uh, well, that's it. And to be, well, as I said already, uh, it is uh, also a certain thing. Um, we are, I, I come now from a very interesting um, uh, conference in Munich, uh, three days it is, the, today is the last day, uh, DLD. It is a, a large digital conference, uh, a lot of young people and not very young from all over the world uh, 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 with their small and large societies and it is optimism and courage, the motto of it and it's also for us the optimism optimism and courage and uh, uh, there it was said uh, uh, we are connecting we are uh, everybody is saying we are connected we are here connected we are there connected but uh, to be a leader you have to learn to disconnect 
to come to your own wisdom. And this is a very important sure. thing to understand. Thank you very much, Mary. How about you? Anne? Can I say something? Yes, because yes. leadership is very important for us. Uh, because when you, ha you have to deal with masters and chief engineers, you know, who are sailing around the world, I mean, you have to be a leadership because you could be an excellent master in navigation and everything, but not a good leader. And we've seen um, cases like that. So I think leadership is you have it or you don't have it. That's what I believe. You might have it a little bit and you have to be trained but you might not have it at all. You mentioned so before being, that you went to the vessels and you went to see how they live. Exactly. And how, tell us about that. So let me tell you, um, the, the, the good masters or chief engineers, right, who are good leaders, you see a smooth vessel. Mm. Everything's moving smoothly, right? No problems with the crew, which is very important, right? Not to have problems with your crew, with the charters, with everybody, with the office, okay. Um, but if you're not a good leader, you can create a lot of problems on board. Okay, because don't forget you're, you're dealing with humans mm. and the vessel is a very small society yeah. with people being away Excellent. from their home in the middle of nowhere and, and let's say they might, not, uh, sorry, they might not reach a port for like 40 days and you know that Katerina. So if you're not a good leader and if you don't have a good psychology, you cannot control your people. <coughs> We see a lot of cases generally, not only our company, generally, right, that uh, if you're not a good leader, the whole vessel is a is a big problem. Uh, there are vessels you don't even hear them. The the master goes on board, or the chief engineer, even the boson, who is the guy that gives the orders to the uh, ABs, to the able seafarer, what to do with their duties. If he's not good in doing that, then the whole vessel is a mess. So that's why I think I've met a lot of people, so I can say that, okay? Because I'm really, in, I mean, I'm dealing with 2,500 people. I, I do believe that I have the experience to say that. So uh, that you see, um, a lot of people they need push, they need training to become leaders. They don't understand that you have to make one step back, look at the problem, put yourself in their shoe, and then take the decision. You know what I'm saying? But this needs, that's why I said, I think, I'm not God, right? I'm just saying my opinion is you have to have it. Yes. You can build it. But you, I mean, somebody who cannot be a leader, you know, uh, I don't see how you can train him. The so I think you must have it in you a bit. He would be then neurotic afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. And how about you, Suleyma? How do you do, deal with that? You know, in blockchain where everyone wants to, you know, there's not a corporate culture, everyone's on their own. How do you deal with that leadership? Decentralization is a new corporate culture, actually. We're building it every day. Um, but I think what's important is, I haven't been mentored as you, but... I have managed to uh, benefit from a lot of people who were supporting me and, the, and, and it's very important to be in a position when you can receive positive feedback. It's often difficult to do. Negative is much more often shared. Positive is rarely shared. And on top of that, when you receive it, you tend not to listen to it. <laughs> so that's, I, di I didn't have one person, but I had a lot of people supporting me and I was able to get this support um, and, and build on it. So one very important point. Another, another one was to ask for help or to use my network on an everyday basis. When I don't know how you are, but when you manage everything in your life, you, I hate asking for help. I hate asking questions. I hate saying this. I don't, I don't know how to do it. And very important to be able to do that with people who you know very well and who are in your comfort zone and who will always be there to help you. Uh, that's, an, that's an important one too. And obviously being that comfort zone for a lot of people is also very helpful. Giving back helps a lot too. Giving back, yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. How about you, Alexandra? Um, my story is, I guess, a little bit similar to the, what some of the other ladies on the panel have said. So um, I also, a strong mentor in my life, was also a, a man. Um, when I was 20 years old, I was finishing my master's at, at Oxford, which has its own sort of male, male-dominated culture. So there was already a little bit of <laughs> elbowing that had to happen there. Um, but then I knew that I wanted to be in the policy uh, in the policy space, and my family is not a political family, not a DC family, uh, so I had to figure out how to do that. So I did my research, and I spotted in the course that at the time he was the undersecretary for energy in the U.S. And I liked his background; he looked like a friendly man. So I just sent him an email, a cold email, and he very kindly replied back. And over the years, from then until now, he's really guided me, but guided me in the sense of also just throwing me in the deep end. Yeah. So we would go there in DC, there are many of these clubs, um, 
where everyone, yes, Senator, how are you, Senator, so on and so forth. And I was a 20-year-old girl. I, I definitely was not in the yes, Senator category. Uh, but you have to learn, and you have to learn very quickly. And in that process, I learned a lot about myself when I'm comfortable speaking up and when I'm better sitting back, maybe, and, and observing the conversation, and then also learning how to uh, engage and instigate with people who, at the time, were uh, on, on a level at which I, I certainly wasn't. And I think to the point of role models as well, I think what we're doing here is very important because I think um, a lot of times when we think about or conceive of role models, there's a tendency to think about the finished product. So you see the successful female CEO, the successful female parliamentarian, and there's, I think, a little bit less attention paid to, to the journey that it's <coughs> taken women to, to get to that. Point. And it's oftentimes probably not a very glamorous story, so it might uh, detract some. But I think there's a lot of value in, in having these kind of conversations um, to, to, to show women what it takes to, to get to the top, and rather than just seeing uh, yeah, the final product on the shelf. Thank you very much. Also, something that you mentioned that is very important is to be bold. Because, I mean, you sent an email, you know, fe not fearing the response, not fearing uh, failure. Yeah. And sometimes, as women, we need to make an extra effort to take that boldness. Yeah, I had a very good friend when I was young, also a, a, a young boy. And he, I think we were very young, and he was a very courageous kind of boy. And it sticks with my head because he always said, the worst thing that can happen is that they'll say no. Yep. So that's yeah, that's kind of the mentality. The worst thing that happens know is that there's you, no You will reply. never know until you ask. Exactly. So I think. So don't argue the point against yourself. Just exactly, ask. Exactly. So being bold, I think, is is very important as well. Thank you. I have a very similar story of being bold. Um, when I first um, put myself forward for an election on the board of directors of the Cyprus Shipping Chamber, it was the first time that a woman ever. Uh, was nominated uh, in the 25 years of the chamber's history and I got a call from someone in the industry telling me what are you doing you're going to embarrass yourself <laughs> um, so we were 11 people standing up for election with 10 positions open and I made it and someone who was coming from a very prominent company didn't but my reaction to him was you know what it's an election some people will win some people will lose why am I embarrassing myself I understand that um, perhaps I was also a bit younger, so perhaps it, it was not realizing <laughs> the danger of doing that. Yeah. Uh, but that, that is something that can deter not only women, but younger people to seek for, you know, positions that they may aspire to. Um, when it comes to mentorship and role models, I have to say I, I never had a role model in business growing up because there weren't that many women in uh, my part of the business, you know. Now we're more. So I think that's one good thing. We have more women role models now, and this is what we're trying to promote. When it comes to mentorship, I also had male mentors. One was my, my dad. He was in the industry, and, and I, I learned my work ethic from him. And the other was someone who's now my friend, uh, and he told me, the politics and the strategy uh, and the lobbying behind being a business leader, which it takes a lot. Uh, but they were never officially my mentors. You just observe and learn. Um, and I think it's very important to, uh, to note that, you know, a mentor can be a man or a woman and it doesn't matter. And quite frankly, we need men to be mentors to women and to younger men, showing them, um, you know, that having a more gender balanced working environment is to the benefit of everyone. And, and we're in society together, men and women, so we cannot bring effective change and long lasting change if we don't cooperate on that. If, you know, half of the population is not on board. And vice versa. And vice, vice versa, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, can I say that, yes. that as mentor, when I said I had mentors, they weren't official member mentors, they were supporters because now we have to put a tag that you have a, a mentor. Mm. You need to have supporters and exactly. you need to ask for the help. You need to put yourself forward for asking and being bold for taking what you want or what you think you, you deserve. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's amazing how you know, according to Lean In organization, men jump and make a decision when they have 40% of the requisites. 
when women wait until they have 100% of the requisites to jump. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we just have to jump without knowing where we're going, because that's the only way to really push a career. No? So I want to ask you, if you have to t say something, just one um, piece of advice for a younger woman that wants to keep you know, uh, um, advancing their career, why would that be that very important piece of advice that you would um, say this younger woman to survive and to thrive? Me? Yes. Well, I'll go back to my first comment. Success is not about gender. It's about uh, character and about wanting it. Uh, and I would say, I would remind, you know, a younger woman or my younger self that they have the right to go after what they want. Yeah. I, I know it's more difficult sometimes for women, but still, it, it, it's difficult for everyone. It's difficult for all the young people, so they should never give up. Um, I would also say continue your education, that's very important. Um, I'm still studying and people are asking me why are you doing it and I believe that uh, I have um, some ideas of how I want to progress my career and I believe that the master's degree I'm doing now will help me do that. Um, so I would say that continue your education, always be on top uh, of your industry, know the updates, know the, the latest innovations, be uh, a step forward, uh, because that's the only way that people are going to take you seriously and people will want to uh, listen to you. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, I would say, have ambition and not be afraid to have it. I, I think sometimes <laughs> we, we associate the word ambition in a negative way together with women, and we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, have ambition because that's the only way you're going to have forward. If you go, go forward, if you don't have a plan uh, or you don't know where you're getting to, then how are you even going to do it? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. How about you, Alexandra? I would echo the point on education very strongly, I think, developing a habit of lifelong learning because right. leadership, and we've thrown the word a lot around on, on the panel, but leadership isn't just the title or the power that comes with it. There's actual, there are actually qualities that that entails. And I think developing those qualities, that also entails a lot of different kinds of knowledge. So knowing your industry and, and being on top of your industry, but I think also knowing other fields, knowing politics, philosophy, religion, whatever it might be. Be, especially as our world starts to become or is becoming more horizontal and networked, engaging with the world, both past, history, and, and present, I think that helps to make better decisions, to foster and, and build stronger relations, and to also communicate better. So education, but in a, in a very holistic sense. And also to the earlier point, and you mentioned something very important when you said that in your industry, you're, we're dealing with people. So education, that's also emotional intelligence, and, and really taking time to, to hone that as well. Um, so my advice would, would be education and re-education. Thank you. Andy? Okay, I would give the same advice that I would give to any man also. So I, I cannot say, what would I say to a woman and to a man? I would say exactly the same thing. I would say, put passion in what you're doing, be persistent, be patient, training, training, training. Um, try to learn from the others, from the mistakes of the others. Uh, listen and learn to listen. Uh, yeah. What I see uh, from my experience, a lot of people don't listen. <laughs> so uh, that's what I would say. Listen and be passionate for what you're doing and patient. Nothing can happen overnight. They say Pisa, you know, Italy, it took I don't know how many uh, years, ages to be built. So things do not happen overnight. And when you're impatient, you will never be good. This is my advice. Thank you, Andy. Now, um piece of advice? I fully support everything that has been said. I would just add two little things. Uh, think out of the box, very important. Yeah, right. And we are multidimensional, so it e may be easier for us to do that. And take risks, very important to take risks. What is the biggest risk you take is having a no, maybe. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yes. please do. Thank you. Mary? Yeah, I come back to the word ambition because I think it's, uh, well, a very important word, but uh, most of people are ambitious, but then you just have to, to have this persistence and power uh, to, to become what you want. But at the same time, you have to just know absolutely for sure whether you want it. Uh, 
-hmm. So you, you, do, you, you just come back a little bit and think it over and uh, maybe, well, uh, take time for yourself and to have visions whether your vision of your life is just what you really want. If I, so important. if I just may add something that I forgot before and you made me think about it, don't feel guilty. Mm. <laughs> That's very important. In my case, it's always the school who calls me. The school, I've, I have never been to the school of my kids, but they always call me when my kids are sick. I don't feel guilty, that's life. They call moms, that's all. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I just also want to say a few words. I, I think if you, if you know what you want, it is very nice to have uh, somebody with whom you could exchange ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think uh, the new labs uh, for young people, which are now made, the techno labs, it's uh, also the possibility to be in the same revere where you can just think it over Agreed. and oh okay maybe this is the startup I want. Yeah. Very interesting you know you have to really um, see if what you think you want is really what you want you know because yeah. Yeah. you fight so hard to get somewhere and then you're like I didn't want it. That I didn't want that. I want to <laughs> echo everything at all, all points <laughs> and one more do not and first of all not just to a, a, a woman or a man it's the same thing for everybody there's no difference there when you start off don't be afraid to fail yeah. When you reach for the stars, you're going to find a few loopholes on the road. So it's uh, life. that's life. So don't be afraid to fail. Do not be discouraged by difficulties. Take them positively. Mm -hmm. So if we take all the toxic, as you said, negatively inside of us, we don't do anything. Turn it positive. So turn your failure to a positive effect. Learn from that and move on. Do not feel guilty that something didn't happen. Just keep moving and make it better. Um, and patience, yes, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. But that's <laughs> life, so is business. So, every Everything. day, yeah. it's a marathon. Thank you very much. What would be your piece of advice? Um, well, lots, uh, lots Everything. Of things. <laughs> I probably have very little to add. So uh, I guess lots of times when we talk to young people, um, they end up not knowing what they want. Uh, so my advice would be keep an open mind. Once you know it, uh, go for it. You can do it. Yeah, and be passionate once you find it. Yeah, thank you very much. Passion, keyword. Passion. Um, so you know, a lot of women would naturally tend to go to become entrepreneurs, not to have to deal with these. Uh, imbalance between the personal life and the professional life. Nonetheless, it's very hard for women entrepreneurs to go there and ask for the money and get a yes from, you know, from private equity firms or venture capital firms because the majority of them are white male dominated and it's very hard for them to understand many of the uh, leadership styles that we as women have. Can you please elaborate on this? Well, um, we actually seen lots of successes in China. Um, I think Huren has this survey, or, or I mean statistics, uh, um, that they they list all the um, like uh, entrepreneurs uh, who self-made like billionaires, um, and then probably six out of ten are coming from China. So um, you just need to go try, and then uh, once I mean they see good examples, and then they probably will be convinced, and then women will get a chance to make money. Um, at least in the asset management industry, uh, we do see uh, a lot more uh, Chinese women taking the portfolio management job and then doing well and then competing with the men. Yeah. Great, thank you. Well, in my experience with finance, although I've seen the statistics about women not being able to get uh, access that easily as men, my experience in the finance sector is that the private equities, the banks, the financiers, the private investors will put their money in if they're inspired by what you are um, pitching to them. So if it is a good idea and if you're passionate about it, because it may be a man pitching and still not get the money. So it is dependent, in my opinion, on the idea the um, the how sustainable it can be and how passionate you are that you can prove that you can take this forward then investors and money will find you or will believe in you it's not easy especially in today's environment where there are a lot of liquidity strains 
for banking from banks and from PE funds and returns have to be made. So it is more dependent on the idea and your passion about what you're starting to do and having done your research correctly and in depth to prove that what you have thought about and what you're about to endeavor on, you've based it and you can say, uh, this is my idea and it fits into this um, segment and it will fit this need of everybody because it's missing because A, B, and C. So it is very much dependent on the idea and your passion <coughs> and your correct preparation. Thank you very much. Yes, I think you're uh, absolutely right. Uh, and uh, I would say uh, maybe that you have to be very insistent. Yes. So <laughs> it's just if it's the first no. Don't tell me no, tell me how. <laughs> yeah. So what didn't absolutely. you like? I'll change and it. Just, <laughs> yes, I change it a little bit and just look at it once more. And this assist insistency helps uh, sometimes a bit in business a lot. Yes. And uh, maybe just also a little bit changing and coming from another door. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> flexible. Find the way. Yes. And this is the flexibility of women. It's fle yes. Women can be very flexible. I'm not sure in those surveys. If the reason that it's women that have not gotten the funds, it is actually based on gender or the idea or the um, feasibility of the project. Some say that um, it has to do because men are the decision makers and you know, some of the, of the companies that are you know, started by women, they don't really understand them. And you know that happened also to the uh, the founders of Spanx, who now is a billionaire, a self-made billionaire and a very successful woman. She said like it was very hard for her to get money from men because they couldn't understand the need to wear Spanx, you know? So there, there are a lot of things in the cosmetics industry or in, in many, many industries that it's hard for men to understand. So I need, I, it, it, um, you need a woman to speak to other women sometimes, you know? Probably, but it's also... This like Maria said, you need to be flexible and try to speak to what they understand. So when we pitch an idea, it's not how we see it. We have to make sure that our audience yeah. understands it. So we're pitching to what they're understanding. So if, if somebody is not understanding the importance of me wearing mascara, okay, fine. <laughs> um, a man probably won't. But of course, he likes the outcome. So start thinking of you know, how he sees it and pitch the need that way. So I'm not sure if it's pitched correctly or is it gender related. My personal opinion is it's not exactly gender related, but it may be the project or the pitch. Thank you. I, I must, I don't often say that, but I, in this time I really agree. I don't think it's gender related. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've been through this all over the course of last year. So Comgo was created after a full year of, of you know, six months of raising funds. And I am back today by 10 big banks. So I have Citibank, MUFG, BNP, Sogen, all the big sus usual suspects in the commodities industry. And five corporates, Shell is a shareholder, Mercuria, Gunvor, Coke, the Americans and SGS, the TIC company. So I've been through this wow. exercise over the course of last year. And yeah, it's, it's a question of convincing. I, I mean, everything we, we mentioned before, hardworking, convincing, spending a lot of time networking, believing, asking questions, don't being afraid of having a no, coming back when you have a no with another idea, how can I do yeah. it? I mean, it's, it's a mixture of that, all that. And, and when you have a good project, I don't think gender is an issue. And, even the other way around, I'm sure all those guys are very proud to have invested in this company because I'm the one leading it today and because exactly. I'm a woman. Definitely. They're looking, investors are looking for returns. They're not looking at the gender who's going to bring them the returns. It's bottom line driven. So. Yeah, I agree. Okay, basically you have covered me, Katerina. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm not a finance person, okay? I'm a people's person. So, um, okay. and I fully agree with you. Uh, the only thing I want to add here, so it's not a matter of gender, okay? I, I mean, come on, we cannot say everything is gender in this life. So, the one thing I would like to add is, according to the ILO, which is the International Labor Organization report in March 2018, the future of work, a literature review, I'm sorry I'm reading because otherwise I'll forget it. The global increase in the share of older people result in a decline of the growth rate of the potential labor force. In addition, rising educational attainment and longer school careers will also continue to lower participation rates among young people, especially in emerging and developing countries where youth participation rates are currently still very high. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Alexandra? 
Um, I agree that it's not, not a gender issue. In the US financial and policy world, though, there still is, I think, uh, in the VC, the venture capital community, there's a bit of an idea of fit and what is a good investor fit. So in the US still, you see at least until I think it was 2013, 95% of all VC funding was going to firms where the CEO was a male. Um, so maybe it's, maybe it's our problem, <laughs> not everybody else. Um, but I think one interesting uh, way and something that I've seen being implemented to not only in terms of funding, but also hiring and kind of removing that kind of idea of, of gender bias or flip. It's actually a, an example that was taken from the music industry. Until about the 1970s, most orchestras were male dominated. And then many orchestras worldwide started hosting blind auditions. And in the context of those blind auditions, the number of women who were moving at, after uh, beyond the first, second, third round increased by about 50-60%. So a little bit in the policy world, what I've seen starting to happen are blind resumes or blind work sample where if that is a problem, you're removing at least that gender bias or uh, an idea of fit. No, there's in the policy gender world... Gender neutral um, ads. Exactly. And, and no, there's still... Gender neutral job description. Exactly. Yeah. Voila. So that's something potentially constructive that could be implemented and I think it depends on companies and sectors, but You're right. it's potentially Shall forward. I say that, yeah. You want to say something? Yes. Yeah. Um, may I add that um, the European Commission and uh, WISTA is on uh, um, platform for change mm -hmm. within the diversity committee of the European Commission. One of the um, efforts they're trying to do, and it has to be implemented um, legalistically, first of all, is gender neutral uh, job descriptions, yeah, first of all, and gender neutral um, assessment yeah. of successes. So it is, it's, it's two ways. It has to come through government, of course, all right, so sure. some people need <coughs> the law, but it, we also need to build it within society and each company on its own for corporate culture. Yeah. The understanding. Hmm? The understanding. To the understanding, yeah. yes. Yeah. I agree. Finally, tell us. Uh, well, uh, I think I, I uh, disagree. I think it is a problem and it, it's an underreported uh, problem. Um, there's this online uh, magazine called The Entrepreneur Magazine and they ran a survey about a year ago. And what they found was that women with young startups or owning their own companies, um, they were less successful than men applying for alone, let's say, for 100,000 US dollars or, or more. And the results were, um, I think, 28% of men uh, were uh, successful and 15% of women. So you can see it's difficult for anyone. It, it, it's a different, ta uh, difficult task anyway. But it's even more difficult for women, and that makes it harder for them to hire staff, to rent office space, uh, it makes our business uh, more difficult. Um, <clears throat> some of you are in the, uh, in the finance sector, so you've given some very good answers. I will give an alternative answer. Uh, within our, our industry, at least, we've seen lately uh, investors uh, pushing uh, companies uh, to be more um, environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. They have asked uh, for proof we have seen of companies that had some uh, accidents on the environment side and the investors were ready to pull out unless there was a plan. So we see now invest investors are more um, interested in or more concerned with um, opinion, the society's opinion. Um, diversity is one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, so I think that's an opportunity to start pushing uh, financial investors towards that as well, uh, trying to explain the business benefits of uh, um, helping a woman or investing in a female-led company and, and also promoting them, why not, if they have taken that step. That is very important, you know, now today the World Bank and IFC if you're not pushing for objective number five, that's the one that's taking away um, gender uh, discrimination, they won't invest in you. Exactly. They won't lend you money. Yeah. Mm. So it has to be a public-private partnership to really make a difference. Exactly. 
So, um, well, many experts expect that the implementation of artificial intelligence, robotics, and other digital innovations would release some labor force and increase unemployment rates. This automation trend is especially challenging for women because they tend to be employed in more routine tasks than men <coughs> across all sectors and across all occupations. New IMF research estimates that 26 million women jobs in 30 countries are at a high risk of being displaced by technology in the next 20 years. This means 180 million women's jobs globally. How is this situation affecting gender equality and what practical solution do you suggest to tackle the problematic? Start here. Well, this is um, I would say this is uh, not a gender problem. Um, with the technology developing, we're going to have less jobs uh, for everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we see, I mean, Maybe. some countries started doing is sort of a retraining yeah, people. Some of the jobs taken away by the robots, uh, maybe you, sh you should have freed the men, right? And then they could do something more interesting, or I mean, where other places are needed. Uh, and there might be service-related things, and there might be more creative things, or entertainment. Uh, people probably end up entertaining each other more. Um, that's sort of uh, my advice. Um, um, uh, I, I guess another point would be um, actually I would say technology will uh, will help women uh, in lots of sense. Uh, for example, we might have the robots doing the housework, and then the women can work more on other things they she's interested in, uh, as well. And then later, previously we talked about uh, uh, telecommunication, <coughs> and then things can I mean we can exchange ideas more freely and easily much uh, than before. So um, I would say I mean we should embrace technologies more. Interesting. Here. Well, for um, I can only speak about the shipping industry. Okay, um, I believe technology is going to be helpful to women and not detrimental. Correct. Uh, because shipping was male dominated, because uh, it was considered that men were needed for a more um, difficult job or a more um, strengthening job or whatever. So. Uh, technology is now taking that part away and allowing women to be more inclusive in other ways. But it's also taking out the jobs of men, technology. So I think it is helping to level out the, the playing field a little bit. So at least in shipping, we see it as an opportunity, or I feel it is an opportunity, rather than a detriment uh, to jobs uh, within the industry. And I like your idea, having a robot at home. Yeah, <laughs> very much. <laughs> It'll definitely help. <laughs> Uh, well, I think, uh, of course, it's a complicated problem, but, uh, for example, for women who have already their professions are in their hand, uh, it helps because there, there are so many who are working now at home, and for women it's the most important thing because they are shifting uh, like this, and they uh, can have family uh, organized, children organized, then they uh, just go somewhere to a conference as you did, and... Uh, being connected to being the connected, family through yeah. technology and uh, coming back uh, to um, to labor things well uh, the global unemployment rate is now very low as uh, during the last decade and uh, for uh, al almost uh, much more uh, uh, it is in the wealthiest uh, countries of our world. And there's a new word now, STEM. If you know what it means, it is the science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. And uh, uh, the positions in this STEM are, are well, are, are just there. Take them. That's a problem. For example, I have this thing. For in India, the shortage of skilled STEM talent doubled from 2014 to 2000. 2018, and the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates uh, mm. the rate of growth for STEM positions uh, is quadruple that of their of other jobs. So uh, uh, we we can estimate that uh, about one million to two and a half million jobs are just lying for us now till 2020. But Good of jobs. course, these are not the normal jobs; they're STEM jobs. jobs. That means that. Uh, well, the world is changing, 
changing, so the education is changing. And if you if you just look at a person who is maybe 60, 70 and doesn't know how to, to deal with iPhone, but you take a five-year-old <coughs> girl or boy, it knows how to do it. So it's, uh, it's our uh, new uh, way of dealing <coughs> with the challenges of the technological world. And if we do it correctly, and I'm absolutely sure that's the problem. For example, in the Soviet Union, one of the most uh, popular professions was engineer. And we had a lot of engineers and uh, beautiful education with math and physics <coughs> and, uh, and uh, so on. But after Perestroika in the 90s, ev everybody wanted to go into law sector to, to be a businessman. So the engineering came down. And uh, uh, that's a problem also in Germany where we are now, so it's uh, uh, um, also the same problem. They have a lot of engineers, but not enough. So this uh, uh, education has to be a little bit changed and maybe it's also, if, if the girl with seven knows that she needs it, she will do it. <laughs> Very interesting, thank you. Um, not ma much to add. Uh, it's clear that on the short run, it's a mas massive help for all of us. That's for sure in our personal <coughs> and business lives, no doubt. On the long run, obviously, we're facing the f what some people call the fourth industrial revolution. So a lot of things are going up currently being reinvented in terms of ways of working, especially in the service industry. So we have need for massive education. Uh, people, creative people, and, uh, and yes, it's a very new complex skills. and, and new, new, skills. new skills and new ways of doing things. So very complex ah. question, but let's, let's, let's see. Thank you. Andy? Angie. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will also talk about shipping. Um, International Chamber of Ship Shipping, ICS, released new study conducted by the Humber School of Business Administration, HSBA, Regarding the potential effects of autonomous ships, I will tell you where I'm leading at, <laughs> on the role of seafarers in the global shipping industry. <clears throat> the study referred to the latest edition of the five-year study of the manpower report conducted by the SES and BIMCO, and which was published in 2016, ICS and BIMCO 2016. According to this report, the forecast growth in the world merchant fleet over the next 10 years and its anticipated demand for seafarers will likely continue to trend of an overall shortage in the supply of officers. This is despite improved recru recruitment and training levels and reductions in officers. Wastage rates over the five pa past five years. The report predicts a shortage of 147,000 officers in 2025, which is more than 18% of the global demand for officers on ships. The figures on this report shows clearly that those seafarers with higher qualifications will move into a very comfortable labor market situation where demand will strongly outstrip supply. The underflying analysis of BIMCO and ICS proposes that demand for officers will increase by around 10% every five years, while the supply remains relatively stagnant. <laughs> and the fact that almost 20% undersupply of officers is objectively no reason to worry about job security. As described, even more optimistic scenarios suggest only a small number of hybrid, remote controlled or automated ships in the next few years. Realistically, automated or semi-automated ships will be rather small, operated firstly in tightly controlled waters close to shores and often be supported by remote control. Even in the most optimistic scenario by 2020, in only two years' time, right? Some 100, somewhere around 100% ships will be operated autonomously. This has no effect on the job market. Autonomous ships are more likely to alter jobs than eliminate them. Mm. This combined with the creation of new types of job will lead to greater prosperity in the long run. So what I'm saying is training, 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 yeah. training, yeah. training. Lifelong learning That's all. is yeah. the word. Learning, yeah. uh, interestingly, uh, Giacomo, last year he mentioned that, you know, with the search of um, mixed reality and artificial intelligence and all this fourth industrial revolution thing, what we need to do, we cannot compete with computers. So what we need to do is to become more human, because 
Computers cannot compete with our human side, with our creative side. So this will open an opportunity for um, the new generations to be more creative, to be more, um, you know, not not as a as a part of the cog in a system, but more as a, you know, more humane ways of of, of working. And in that in that same regard, I want to ask you, Alexandra, what do you think, you know? Some people criticize the gig economy because, I mean, this trend is just starting. It will grow exponentially, but um, it's not giving social welfare to the to the employees. It's not giving um, access to to healthcare and to any many other other things. What do you think about that? And how can public and private um, institutions work together to? solve this problem. Yeah, sure. No, it's a, uh, it's a big challenge. I'd just like to circle back to the original question very quickly, if I may, and then I'll, and I'll answer that one, because I think it's very interesting and also very complex, the issue of um, automation. And I think auto with automation and the fourth industrial revolution, it's a little bit like what we said earlier in terms of having it all. We can have it all, just not all at once. And I think automation is going to affect different parts of society, but also not all at once. So you can think of it in terms of waves, for instance. And in the first wave, it's all, of course going to be sort of the menial, repetitive uh, tasks globally women do tend to be concentrated in those a little bit more so than men. So perhaps women will be more affected in the first wave of, of automation, if you will. But then if you, as you sort of start to go up the food chain, the automation food chain, eventually it will touch everybody. So perhaps just not all at once. And one of the ways of dealing with that, I think, is, is definitely STEM and education. And there are a lot of interesting uh, public-private partnerships and other initiatives um, all over the world. Pakistan Pakistan, for instance, is an example. They had a very successful uh, ICT for girls program where they've set up learning centers throughout the country to which girls and young women could come to be trained up uh, in those skills. Uh, and to the point about the gig economy, I think it's a huge challenge to which, unfortunately, I wish I had a silver bullet, but nobody really has um, a good answer because I think we're still in that interesting phase where we're trying to figure out what exactly it's going to look like. It's a bit like the Gramsci saying, the old is dying and the new hasn't been born yet. So we have some idea, perhaps, of what it will be. It will be more decentralized. We'll be able to perhaps have more flexibility. Um, so I think we're at the stage where the workforce is perhaps moving faster, and yeah. policy hasn't yet caught up with, one, understanding exactly the dynamics that are unfolding, uh, what that means for future work, and what that means for policy. So a constructive way forward that's happening in many countries around the world now are um, in the tech sector, for instance, or referred to as regulatory sandboxes, where uh, tech startups, be it in AI or uh, whatever it might be, um, it's almost like a controlled experiment, effectively, between the company and the government, where there's a learning from the government side how far to go with, for instance, regulation, what kind of social protections uh, does that particular company and then that particular industry need, and then vice versa from the private sector side, how can we constructively engage with and communicate the public sector space? So I think the jury is still out on what it will look like at the end, but we're in that learning and discovering period, and I think those regulatory sandboxes are um, hugely important for discovering the, the context of that. Thank you very much. And lastly? Um, going back to the, the first question, um, I will talk about um, our industry again. So I, I will say that there has been a recent report in the shipping and port um, <coughs> industries uh, that showed that menial tasks will disappear, uh, but this will be replaced by jobs that require higher levels of training and higher levels of computer uh, literacy. So many tasks in these areas, in the port and in the shipping operations, they have been traditionally uh, labor-heavy, therefore male-dominated. So we believe that uh, with this new change, as uh, remote operations take over, as robotics take over, um, the new roles uh, do not seem to have a gender bias attached to them. And this is really good for the women in the industry. And we see some of them, some of these jobs are promoted directly towards women, like uh, port operations in Latin America. Mm. 
so what I would say, this is not about losing jobs, it's about um, training young youngsters differently, it's about retraining the workforce uh, responsibly, and it's about giving opportunities to everyone uh, who des deserves them. Now, if I will support what you said about the gig economy, and I, I will pose a question that maybe it's a question we don't want to hear, but can we have it all? Can we have, uh, can we work from home, have a better <laughs> quality of life, and then have uh, the health insurance yeah. that we want and, and have all the benefits? I'm not sure if we can. Yeah. Maybe in the future we will find a solution. And I agree. Yeah. Uh, it, that's always the case. Policy, regulations, the law. Yeah. Yeah. Well, technology runs yeah, faster than exactly. that. So yeah. I do yeah. believe that at some point, yeah. regulation yeah. and law will catch up, and maybe that's <laughs> where we will find the balance. Uh, but as you said, yeah. it's still to be seen. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. You know, I had some uh, questions to the audience, but now I think it's a better idea to some give your <laughs> microphone. And you can ask directly. The other way. <coughs> Good evening to you. My name is Raj Kumar. I'm the Vice Chancellor of Jindal Global University in India. I'm a law professor and I've been fascinated by this panel. So I want to first of all thank uh, Caspian Week for a visionary panel to start this uh, uh, you know, conference in Davos. So it's been very inspiring to hear all of you. I've been also patiently waiting to hear the Me Too word, but in two hours we couldn't get that. So one of the important questions that I want to raise both as a lawyer and as somebody who very strongly believes in issues surrounding diversity and accountability within organizations, it will be useful for you to reflect about how the Me Too movement in general, but also the workplace environment within your organizations and institutions have shaped the way we need to develop a future workplace for women in general, but also more importantly to instill a sense of responsibility and respect within the organizational culture. You mentioned about uh, culture emanating from the top. Uh, one of the things that the Me Too movement did is to move beyond legal forms of accountability that can create uh, you know, some sort of a, a better understanding and opportunities for a respectful, collegial and a safer environment for women. <coughs> so it will be useful for you to reflect that. Thank you very much. Someone wants to uh, add to it? Well, I, I think uh, the Me Too movement was um, a very good start um, uh, for discussion. And uh, it was a very good start uh, for discussing all the things you said about respect in the workplace, about equal rights, about women having the right, and they do have the right to, um, and also men, because uh, let's face it, we should talk about both, both genders. We, we have heard of harassment case for both genders, that they have the right to go to their working place and feel safe and being able to be productive. Um, where I had some objection with the Me, the Me Too movement was that at some point it, I, I felt as a woman that it went too far. Yeah. We, we got to the place where we were blaming men just for being men. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> this, this yeah. is where uh, I felt that it was a step over. But as a discussion, yes, I, I believe that it brought change. Certainly it has in our own industry because before these things really they were not discussed but at least now i think everyone is more aware uh, of, of these issues everyone is more aware of their behavior which is a, a fantastic thing i think when we reach that point where everyone is aware of their behavior then we will definitely have a better working place in general for everyone in all industries we have space for one more question yeah, I, I <laughs> <laughs> my god Hi, uh, my name is Irina, and uh, I moved from Siberia to Los Angeles about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now I'm um, running or managing, I'll have to say, about 35 projects, uh, commercial development company, and about 100 men every day. So my question to you is, how do you uh, separate and don't bring your work environment to your house and still manage to be feminine and, um, you know, not to argue, not to fight with your man at home. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny you ask this question. Sorry to yes, interrupt. <laughs> what I noticed around this panel is that there's a very well mastering of all the egos here, which is something 
I must admit that you're very strong at and <laughs> it brings a lot of strength to everything that has been said today and it's, it's a way of doing it. It comes natural. Yeah, it, it's, it's natural. And I believe that uh, women in the workforce um, it, do not need to lose their femininity. Yeah. I am a personal advocate of be yourself, okay? You can be um, successful by being yourself not by adopting another person's or another gender's qualities. Build on your own, and you don't need to lose being feminine uh, to become successful, to be able to um, be a manager and be heard, okay? Uh, it's a different leadership style to be able to motivate and be heard than being able to just impose, okay? We're way past that era. Yeah. Yeah. I did right. had some time in my early career, in my early years, where I totally lost it, where I gained <laughs> a, a lot of weight. Uh, I was studying my master's. I was recently married. I was uh, I couldn't handle it all, so I just gave myself to the ruin, you know. And it took me like three years to get back on track. And now I really regret not. Um, at that time, health. And wellness was not part of my priorities. And today, you know, it doesn't matter if I have a lot of meetings and it doesn't matter. I have to prioritize my health and I wake up and I do exercise even though I love to eat and I love to. But <laughs> I was, I, I, you know, you don't want to see a picture of me those years. Really. Yeah, <laughs> Can like I just said, it's in? priorities. <laughs> Can I just jump in really quickly? Because I think, too, there's this uh, sense that we have to somehow separate our professional from our personal. No, we don't. I think we're, we're complex, no? Yeah. And, and the two are naturally intertwined. Yeah. So I, I don't see a problem with bringing necessarily work home. For instance, I'm the type of person, I need to talk about my day. I need to, <laughs> yeah. to get it out there. And I'm lucky that I have a partner who patiently listens while I get it out and then okay done and we, <laughs> we, go on into with, something else. we move on with the rest of the day but I, I don't think that it, we necessarily have to compartmentalize ourselves so starkly in that way and I think the two should uh, and yeah. as somebody said it comes naturally just organically but, but then it's a nice partnership exactly yeah? that is the correct partnership yeah exactly the right partner yeah. <laughs> 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 Hi, thank you. Um, um, I come from India and I'm a lawyer, and um, it was really uh, heartening to hear Maria and Dr. Fan talk about China and, and, and Russia. Um, you know, in India, we have uh, <coughs> one of the lowest uh, uh, rates for women participating in workforce, less than 30%. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, did you, like, is there, what, creates that differentiation? What have you seen that has worked? Is it government policies? Is it culture? And was there a tilting point that you saw where you know things got better? I think uh, in our country, it was, of course, uh, at the beginning, the uh, uh, government uh, policy. It was a socialist country in the Soviet Union, and uh, the role of the woman was uh, very high standing. Uh, so, as I said, the education was equal, and uh, you, you just had the possibility to study and afterwards to work. And uh, the state did everything for you. You had kindergarten. Uh, uh, how do you call it? Pre preschool, preschool from three years on. School, it was all organized. If the woman was working till six o'clock, seven o'clock in the evening, the school had a special group uh, for children who were taken out from school at six o'clock in the evening. So it was very easy to work at that period of time. And when we lost it after perestroika, the women started to understand what they had. And it's the same, for example, in GDR now in Germany, they are, they are having also a lot of problems because, for example, in Berlin, uh, there are not enough uh, preschool uh, education, so there are uh, uh, nice, uh, nice families with nice children, but they, the, the women or the men sometimes uh, the woman, uh, the men is uh, staying at home because they don't have uh, the possibility to leave children. So it is, uh, I think, a very special social uh, social problem, and I think one of their. Um, 
uh, real social challenges for women. And I, uh, we didn't speak about it, but maybe I just uh, have the possibility now to say that we are in this new 21st century, have more chances because we are living so long. So the woman uh, in aging, well, aging is uh, not, uh, the, not the best word for that, but with 50, 60, you can study something new, you can get a new profession or a new skill, or you can go into this uh, social life and help others. And uh, I think for, for these women, it would be also a very nice thing to give themselves, for example, for building up a new uh, 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 pre-school uh, education, because we need it. We need it for the whole world. And uh, I think, uh, for example, in Africa, they do a lot in this case because, uh, well, they had no education in most of the countries. But they are starting on a new level. And this new level with different funds coming from rich people also from Africa, they get uh, this uh, kind of education for children, for, uh, for girls, with this tech uh, intuition, yeah, a little bit. So I think for India, for India, it would be also a good way to find these new phones and uh, uh, making new schools and helping women uh, uh, this way. Can, can I say? Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, the Chinese experience was be very similar. Uh, we went through the kind of period uh, like uh, maybe men doesn't make enough uh, to to support the family, so women has to work. And then after that, I mean, both sides work, and then it became a. Uh, um, a sort of a given uh, to a lot of uh, families and, uh, and for women. And actually these days um, we actually see a little bit of change uh, to go backwards. Some women choose not to work. Um, so um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but also I want to share another example of uh, continuous learning and then and as people go uh, live longer and then we definitely need to keep this learning. Uh, my, both my parents are over 80 years old and my mom learned to use WeChat to shop for groceries and my dad refused to it. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, for your time, and I hope you enjoyed it.